America and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. On today's episode of Battlegrounds, our focus is on the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, a counterterrorism ally and long-standing trade and security partner of the United States. Our guest is His Excellency Yusuf al Uteba, Ambassador to the United States and the Emirati Minister of State. Ambassador al Uteba has worked to improve nuclear energy cooperation and regional security cooperation in the Gulf region. Recently, Ambassador al Uteba played a vital role in facilitating the September 2020 Abraham Accords which normalized relations between the UAE and Israel. Before his appointment as ambassador in 2008, al Uteba served as the Director of International Affairs for the court of Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed al Nayan in Abu Dhabi. Historically, the people of the UAE were traders, merchants, and fishermen. Today, this country of nearly 10 million people controls the sixth largest oil reserves in the world and the seventh largest reserves of natural gas. Those vast resources, combined with Emirati entrepreneurial spirit, political stability, and openness, transformed the country into one of the world's most important financial and commercial hubs. After a naval victory over the Qasimi family in 1819, the British established a strong presence in the region. British diplomats allied with the different Emirati sheikdoms, eventually bringing them together in a single, loose confederation, the Trucial States. After the discovery of oil in 1958, the Emirates moved toward unification and became independent in 1971. The UAE has a single commander-in-chief, but the leaders of each emirate form a federal supreme council that serves as the paramount federal decision-making body. The Bani Yas Tribal Federation, based in Abu Dhabi and led by the al Nayan family, holds the presidency of the UAE. From the days of the Trucial States and the British Protectorate, Iran has coveted their neighbor's strategic location and, later, their immense natural resources. In 1979, Iranian Revolution and the proximity of the Iran-Iraq War to the Emirati coast intensified threats to Emirati security and prosperity. Those threats provided incentive for the UAE to join the Gulf Cooperation Council, or GCC, as a founding member in 1981. The GCC is meant to foster economic and security cooperation in a region rich in resources but racked by violence. Iran poses the most significant threat to many of the GCC countries. Religious and geopolitical factors made Sunni Saudi Arabia and Shia Iran mortal enemies since the Iranian Revolution in 1979. A decades-long dispute continues between the UAE and Iran over three strategically located Gulf islands and the gas reserves that lie beneath them. The UAE military intervened alongside Saudi Arabia and Yemen to fight Iranian-supported Houthi forces in a civil war that has created the world's most acute humanitarian crisis. Houthis have fired Iranian missiles from Yemen into UAE and Saudi Arabia, and Iran has damaged Saudi Arabian oil infrastructure with a swarm of drones and cyber attacks. Iran continues to threaten and occasionally attack shipping in the Persian Gulf and Bab al-Mandeb, two waterways essential to the free flow of oil and gas. The UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt view Iran as the principal driver of sectarian conflict across the Middle East and see the export of Iran's revolutionary ideology as well as the Sunni Islamist ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood movement as the principal causes of instability and violence from North Africa to the Levant to the Gulf. The United States and the UAE enjoy a strong security and economic partnership. The UAE joined the U.S.-led coalition to free Kuwait after Iraq's invasion of that country in 1990. UAE special forces have fought against the Taliban in Afghanistan 
and against jihadist terrorists in Somalia, the UAE plays a vital role in isolating terrorist organizations from sources of financial and ideological support. The UAE is the largest export market for U.S. goods in the Middle East, and partnerships across the energy, education, and healthcare sectors are strong. We welcome Ambassador Aluteba as the UAE implements the 2020 Abraham Accords, copes with humanitarian crisis from civil wars in Syria and Yemen, confronts aggression from Iran, and undertakes promising initiatives in education, healthcare, space, and energy. Ambassador Yusuf al Taiba, welcome to Battlegrounds, Marhaba. Let me begin by saying what a what, what, what a privilege it was to work with you years ago, and it's just great to see you. Thanks for joining us uh, on this program. I know our viewers are going to get a lot out of this discussion. My pleasure. It's great to be with you. And when I was invited, I jumped at the chance just in order to reconnect with you again, HR. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, you know, I've been cheering you on in, in, in recent years, the, the work that we began in 2017 and seeing that come to fruition in the form of the Abraham Accords, the normalization of relations initially between uh, UAE and, and Bahrain. Uh, and, then, and then the spark that, that is given, we, we hope, uh, to, to, uh, to enduring peace uh, in, the, in the region. And I, what I'd like to do is, is to ask you, you know, really, can you tell our viewers you know, how you think this came about? how this historic move of establishing relations with Israel and then placed UAE at the forefront, I think, of, uh, of promoting enduring peace in the region. Sure. So I think the first thing that we should focus on or at least try to pay attention to is that the region is changing. For people who have been operating in the UAE for, or in the Middle East for a long time, I think the dynamics in the region are changing and people are kind of overlooking it or neglecting it. And what you saw in the Abraham Accords, not just with the UAE, but how quickly three other countries followed suit, kind of reflects the attitudes and the mindsets that are changing. HR, people are tired of conflict. People are tired of war. People are tired of, you know, very stagnant political issues. It doesn't mean they're less important. It just means that maybe some of the approaches we've taken in the past have not worked. And maybe it's time to consider new approaches. What really triggered the Abraham Accords to happen the way they did at the time they did was the debate on annexation. For some of us who have been talking and working with the Israelis quietly for the past couple of years, we, we really believe that annexation was going to harm that trajectory. You know, you've, saw, you've seen Israeli athletes participate in sports tournaments in the UAE. Israel was about to participate in the Expo, in the Dubai Expo coming up this October. These things would have been risked if annexation took place. The well, United I remember, States, I remember that fa that uh, famous op-ed you wrote uh, in the Israeli periodical, warning about West Bank annexation. And and I, I think if, if if annexation had happened, I think this this great work that you've done never would have come to fruition. So I, so please go please go on. I just wanted to mention that you had a really pivotal role in that aspect of the agreement. So so that's exactly how we started the conversation. I, I was talking to our leadership saying, hey, if, if we're trying to open up and move gradually and get closer to Israel, annexation is going to risk that. We couldn't do it in the region, given public opinion, given sort of, I think, the, the consequences of annexation. So we put out that op-ed in Hebrew, middle of June, to say, hey, guys, think carefully about this. We understand it's a sovereign decision. We understand it's you know something that you guys can do. But you know, whatever you decide, it will have consequences. If you want to get closer to us, annexation will prevent that. And so that op-ed was kind of the opening salvo that ultimately led to negotiations, which ultimately led to the Abraham Accords. We managed to do something that we that is ultimately in our interest and managed to stop annexation at the same time. Well, you know, I, I, I love the name, obviously, because it communicates that we're all people of the book. And I think it has an effect on arresting you know not only the this destructive fitna that we see in the region this sectarian civil war but also i think it, it helps remove you know the, this this rationale or ideological justification for those who use a perverted interpretation of religion to justify terrorist acts and 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 the murder of innocents and so i was going to ask you how much did that destructive civil war and in fact 
Iran's role in, in, in fomenting sectarian violence across the region, right? From, you know, from Lebanon, obviously, but through the Syrian civil war and that the disaster that is the, these you know, serial episodes of mass homicide and the tremendous, tremendous suffering there in Iraq. And then, of course, in Yemen as well. How did, how did the threat from Iran, Iran's four decade long proxy war, right? Against the great Satan, the United States, the little Satan, Israel, and the Arab monarchies, how did that play into the the strategic dynamic that you mentioned that is shifting in the region? So unfortunately, there's two sides of what you just described. There's the Iranian side promoting Shia extremism or Shia ideology, where they try to act like the Vatican of Shia Muslims. But it also sort of fuels Sunni extremism on the other side. That's how you get Al-Qaeda. That's how you get ISIS. That's how you're going to get whatever comes after ISIS. The two basically fuel each other into what we are living in today. So several years ago, we came to the conclusion that, unfortunately, Islam has been hijacked. Uh, The only people who are aware of Islam or get their first impression of Islam get it through terrorist activities, shootings, bombings. And to the average person who doesn't really understand our religion, this is their perception of how Islam is, is, is practiced. And it's not. And me as a moderate Muslim, I get very annoyed every time I have to defend Islam because someone crazy goes out and does something. So we, we became much more vocal about what Islam really is, about a moderate, tolerant, accepting version of Islam. We even had a year of tolerance. We had a minister of tolerance. And so we kind of tried to reclaim our religion from this extremist version or perversion of it. And so even before the Abraham Accords HR, you remember we welcomed the Pope in February of 2019. We have conferences about interfaith and tolerance. And well before the Abraham Accords, we decided we're going to build an Abrahamic house in Abu Dhabi. The Abrahamic house is a huge structure that has a synagogue, a church, and a mosque all side by side to kind of demonstrate that we are supposed to live together. And then after that, you have the Abraham Accords, which adds a political level to sort of the tolerance and religious message that we've been advocating for many, many years before that. So I would put the two together, the religious understanding and interfaith aspect of what we've been trying to do, plus down the normalization and the Abraham Accords with Israel that adds a political level to what we've already been doing. Yeah, I think that's such an important point for our viewers to understand. I mean, what keeps these jihadist terrorist organizations on life support is their ability to portray themselves as protectors of beleaguered Sunni communities. And I think that what what the Abraham Accords helps do is isolate these groups from sources of ideological support. Your initiatives, as you mentioned, in this connection were immensely important. You know, I'm I'm thinking back to that, to Donald Trump's trip to Saudi Arabia and the meeting with the GCC countries and People back then were saying, like, what the heck is Donald Trump doing, going, making his first trip uh, to, to, to the Middle East? It struck them as odd. But really, I think we built some significant momentum out of, out of that trip uh, with uh, the Center for Combating uh, Jihadist uh, uh, Ideology, uh, as well as, as the Center for Isolating These Groups from Sources of Financial Support as well. And I wondered if you might share with our viewers what you think your projections are into the future. How well are we doing? in this fight against jihadist terrorist organizations. What do you think the prospects are for the future? So the honest report card is you're doing very well once they get onto the battlefield. Once they grab a weapon or put on a suicide vest, they are sort of, they have a bullseye on their back and we go after them and we've become very good at going after terrorists. Where I don't think we're doing quite as well, to be honest, is the level before, when they're just an extremist, when they're promoting hate speech online, or when they're calling for a very radical interpretation of religion, when they're just a step before they get onto the battlefield, we pretend they're not extremists. We ignore all the signs of the people who are about to get onto the, ter- onto the field. HR, you, you, can, you couldn't name a household terrorist that did not graduate from something like the Muslim Brotherhood or its equivalents. Osama bin Laden, Ayman al-Zawahiri, you name it. They've started somewhere where it was just an extremist platform and graduated to a terrorist. And I think that's where we kind of overlook it or we don't pay attention to it. I think that's the gateway drug to terrorism. And I think we're not doing a good job on that end. 
And, you know, this has been a source of tension, obviously, between between the proponents of the Gulf states, especially uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia, uh, also Egypt, uh, with with Qatar, uh, and as well with Turkey, right? And and what what more could Qatar, Turkey, other countries do to restrict the flow of resources to those who promote this extremist ideology, which, as you said, is kind of the you know the gateway to jihadist terrorist organizations. And you know the way I think about it, Yusuf, is, is there's this cycle, right? It's a cycle of of ignorance, right? A- ignorance that that is used to foment hatred and hatred that is used to justify violence against innocents. And I think you're right that you have to break that cycle at every point, not just once they begin to, to commit violent acts. So, so 2021, I think this is the major fault line our region is not going through. It is not uh, Sunni Shia. It is not Arabs versus Persians. I think the biggest fault line in our part of the world is what kind of future do we want for the region? Do we want a future where religion and ideology is on one side of the tracks and governance is on the other side of the tracks, something that we've learned from the West? Or do we want a world where there's more ideology and religion injected into governance, where you, do, you know, women have to be covered or have to do this? I certainly believe in separation between religion and state. Uh, I believe that. My government believes that. I think that's the way to the future. I've been in government for 20 years, HR, and I've never sat in a meeting where we had to debate policy and say, well, you know, what does our religion say about what we should do on the energy front? Or, you know, what does the Quran say on how we should do our infrastructure? But that's not how it works. We believe religion is a personal thing. If I want to pray in my house five times a day, 50 times a day, or zero times a day, that's my business. That's not the business of the state. And to me, I think this is the biggest sort of fault line or point of contention that we have in a region is do we want a more civil, forward-looking society or do we want a more ideological, religious society? Well, you're obviously on the opposite end of that. You have the theocratic dictatorship in, in Iran, right, that is, that, that is, uh, you know, that, that is ruled under this, this ideology or this idea of Vilayet al-Faqih or the rule of the jurisprudent. You have since 1979 Iran promoting you know, its, its revolutionary ideology across the region in a way that has helped to create this, uh, sec- this cycle of sectarian violence, this destructive fitna in the region. You, know, you have an election coming up in Iran here very soon, uh, and Iran has been making making threats to enrich uranium to 60 percent uh, and, uh, and and has taken a range of, of, of disruptive actions in the region that sustain support for proxies. But some even more recent events with uh, your attacks on on tankers and so forth. And of course, your country has been on the receiving end of Iranian rockets uh, from Yemen. W- what do you think the trajectory is within Iran? And, and what do you think the trends are in terms of the degree to which Iran is, is threat- continues to threaten your know, peace and, and security in the region? Um, so I just read a piece by someone I think we both know, Kareem Sadapur from Carnegie. He wrote a very insightful piece about trying, trying to explain and trying to help people understand the identity of the Iranian regime. And mm-hmm. one of the first points he makes is the Iranian regime requires enmity with the United States. Regardless of who's in charge, regardless of what kind of system they have in place, for their, for their identity, for their existence, they need the U.S. as an adversary. And so if, if the question you're asking me is, can we get the Iranians to moderate? Uh, will the JCPOA become uh, a tool where, you know, pa- moderates are empowered? I, I don't believe so. I don't think so. I have seen no evidence of that. But I do know that we need to live with them in peace. We share the region. We live in the same region. We want to live in peace. We know what we want from Iran. We want non-interference, no missiles, no proxies, right? What we don't know is what they want from us. We're, we live together. Now, the question is, do you see us as equals or do you see us as subordinates or do you see us as a you know, former you know, Persian territory? So the question is, how do we get to a place where we can operate as normal nations and countries together? And I. I I still have not figured that out with Iran. <laughs> you know, I, I agree with you. I think we, we neglect really two facts really about the, 
about the regime and and the prospects for the future. And 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 the first of those is the ideology of the revolution. The second is, hey, they've been waging a, a four decade long proxy war uh, against us, and it's unrealistic to assume that they're just going to change automatically their their permanent hostility right to to us. And so. Uh, you know, I, I think the Abraham, I mean, I think the, the Abraham Accords is is, a, is great progress. I think an effort to try to resurrect uh, the JCPOA in a way that makes concessions to the Iranians would be would be a mistake. What what do you think are the the prospects of a of another nuclear deal with Iran? Do you have any concerns about uh, what seems to be the you know nostalgia you know for two, 2016 uh, and to turn the, the clock back to when that when that nuclear deal was in effect? So, so we've been talking closely with the new Biden team, and I think the one thing that I'm optimistic about, or at least I'm positive about, is they do understand that 2021 is very different than 2015. And what they inherited in the form of maximum pressure, while they may or may not agree with how they got there, it is leverage. And they have a better hand today. And Iran is in a worse situation economically today. So you are in a much better position to drive a much better deal you are essentially in the driver's seat to get to a point to where we can address what I believe were shortcomings in JCPOA. Uh, Shortcomings were duration and why haven't we addressed missiles and proxies? Why do they get to have enrichment that can ultimately lead them to a militarized program where your partners and allies, the guys who go to war with you, did a nuclear program without enrichment, without reprocessing? How can anyone justify to the average layman that You've put a standard on your friends, right? That's up here, but you put a standard on your adversaries that's much lower. So I don't think until someone can explain that logic to me. And and then here's the other dilemma in the future. Let's say you go back into JCPOA. What prevents any future country in the region that says, that comes up to the United States and says, I want the same deal. I want the exact same deal that the Iranians got. I want to enrich. Uh, You can put the same restrictions on me. You can put the same thing, but I want the exact same program. It becomes very hard for the U.S. to say no to country X or country Y when they come and ask for exactly the same thing. So precedent's important. Uh, I think the, there is uh, leverage today that you didn't have in 2015. I think the region looks different. The dynamics are different. The Abraham Accords make things look different. So I hope we can get to a much better deal than the first one. I think it's been encouraging so far to hear Secretary Blinken at least talk about that connection, the connection between uh, the the nuclear program uh, and and Iran's destructive behavior in the region, and as well as the flaws to the original deal. So I uh, I, I hope that we don't continue on this assumption that that, that a, a deal with Iran will change the nature of the regime, because I know I, I don't believe that's the case as, as as you mentioned. I wonder if I could take you a little bit further away uh, from from the Gulf region and to talk about Afghanistan. You played a leading role years ago in, in the commitment of UAE special forces uh, to the fight uh, against uh, against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, inside of Afghanistan. And UAE forces have done a tremendous job over many years in, in Afghanistan. What you, do you have any concerns now about the, you know, this peace agreement that was concluded between the United States and the Taliban, and now the effort to get the, the Afghan government to sign up for a, a peace agreement, even though the Taliban is, is not holding up their end of what is really a weak agreement with them with no ceasefire. Um, Do you have concerns about what might happen in Afghanistan? My concern is that if there is a a sort of an abrupt withdrawal based on the current deadline, May 1st, that it will serve the interests of sort of the more illiberal forces in Afghanistan. And because the government was not part of the negotiating process, they will have the weaker hand. And you're going to end up in an Afghanistan that looked a lot like Afghanistan right before 9-11. And so my worry is that we will make sort of a reverse, reverse uh, progress. And then we'll get Afghanistan back to, I think, what most Afghanis, at least the ones I talk to, do not want. So I think it's really important to get buy-in from the Afghan government. And whatever the Afghan government, the U.S., and the Taliban agree to, I think that, should be, that, that would be acceptable to us if all three parties agree. Now, the question is, can those three parties reach an agreement uh, that they can all live with? And, you know, frankly, I, just, I don't think the Taliban's changed, Ambassador. You know, they, they've, you know they, I don't think this, this idea that 
they're willing to share power or to implement a benign form of Sharia uh, or to, 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 to put in place a bold line between them and Al Qaeda and other jihadist terrorists. I just, I just don't see that happening. I think it's a, a pipe dream and I'm concerned about it. And of course, there are regional dimensions to the conflict. Pakistan plays a destructive role there with their support for uh, jihadist terrorist organizations in this terrorist ecosystem along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. You know, UAE is very influential in, in South Asia generally, and I think with Pakistan in particular. I remember the work you know, that, that, that we did with, uh, with, with Sheikh Taknoon, uh, as well as, as with, uh, with Dr. Massad and others to form this quad with Afghanistan. And to and to really help convince Pakistan, it was in their interest to, to to pursue their their objectives in the region through diplomacy, right? Rather than using these groups as an arm of their foreign policy. What do you see as the trajectory in South Asia broadly, and in connection, especially with with Pakistan and and the way Pakistan has used these organizations uh, for for so many years? So uh, just like when when we were working together on this, it, we it's hard for us to see a way to stabilize Afghanistan without Pakistan playing a helpful role. And so the goal is always, how can we create buy-in from the region, from the neighbors, from the people who have a vested interest in Afghanistan to make sure that in Afghanistan, a stable Afghanistan is in their ultimate national interest. And that's what we were trying to do back then. I don't know if we're terribly active on it today because we're not part of the, the Taliban US negotiation. But I'm not sure if you saw about a month, no, about three weeks ago, an article came out that basically highlighted the role the UAE played in bringing the Kashmir uh, yeah. escalation down and sort of created a ceasefire, hopefully ultimately leading to restoring diplomats and getting the relationship back to a healthy level. We try to be helpful where uh, we have influence with two different countries. So India and Pakistan was the most recent one. But you remember about three years ago, we also brought the Ethiopians and the Eritreans together for a peace deal, uh, which seems to not be doing too well right now. But, you know, to the extent we can bring people together and create a win-win environment, whether it's Ethiopia or in Eritrea, Afghanistan, Pakistan and India or UAE and Israel. You know, we've been we've been doing a lot of that, I would say, in the last two to three years. Well, that's immensely important work. I saw I, I saw uh, Prime Minister uh, Imran Khan's. You know, a message the, the uh, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, that that he wants to in, engage in talks with Prime Minister Modi. Uh, I, I hope that happens. He he got COVID right after that, so he's been, it's been delayed. But of course, this this comes down often to what the Pakistani army really wants. And and um, and so I, I wonder, what do you think the prospects are for you know, a better relationship, which is kind of a low standard, right, <laughs> between India and Pakistan? Uh, because you know that could have very important regional dynamics, right? I think Pakistan is in large measure driven in Afghanistan by its fear of encirclement, right? By uh, uh, by India on one side and by an India friendly government in Afghanistan on the other. Do you, do you think that this is this is a, a, a uh, an objective worth pursuing these Absolutely. days between India and Pakistan? Absolutely. Uh, they might not sort of become best friends, but. At least we want to get it to a level where it's functional, where it's operational, where they are speaking to each other, where there's lines of communication. And that's that's our goal. You know, we don't think they're going to become, uh, you know, uh, most favored nations with each other. But I think it's important for them to have a healthy, functional relationship, which is exactly our objective. And you do you have a strong relationship with India as well, of course, you know, because of uh, of the richness of natural resources in UAE and that you're an oil and gas exporter and India has obviously huge demand. Uh, how do you see the future of UAE-India relations? And do you think India might be a place where the UAE can, can really take the lead in energy security as you, as you, as you uh, diversify into renewable sources of energy, cleaner sources of energy? You know, how do you see India the India UAE relationship, and could you share your thoughts on on uh, on energy security uh, as well as the related issues of, of of climate and environment? So for us, India is one of our most important countries and relationships. Not just because there's a little over two million Indians that live in the UAE, but also because of the historical nature of the relationship, where trade routes, uh, experience, culture experiences between the two countries are incredibly strong. 
India is one of the most important countries for us for economic reasons, for social reasons, for cultural reasons. So we've been trying to enhance our relationship with them for, for several years now. And I think it's really important to look at it completely holistically. So not just trade and economics, but also uh, leading into your question on climate and energy security. Uh, we're trying to find ways to work with them on all of these fronts. Um, Secretary Kerry, who's visiting Abu, Abu Dhabi right now, is actually heading to India next to try to find ways to enhance not just the UAE-India relationship, but the US's India relationship as well. So India for us is one of those countries that we spend a lot of time trying to work on because it's important for us. And with President Modi, um, we've really enhanced the relationship significantly the last three or four years. You know, I, th I think that you know, if, if India succeeds, we all succeed, right? In, ter in terms of being able to overcome the the, uh, the obstacles to progress there and take advantage of the tremendous opportunities, right? A, a small problem in India is a big problem for the world, just based on based on scale. And and I think the work that you're doing in the area of uh, uh, of bridging into into renewable energy, the conversion uh, to you know to cleaner burning fossil fuels as a bridge, uh, I, I think that that could have a tremendous impact. Could, could you talk more about some of these initiatives, the economic initiatives for diversification and for uh, bridging into to alternative forms of, of energy production in UAE? So let, let's talk about the big picture now. I think one of the key messages I've, I've brought back from the Emirates in the last couple of trips back was we are really focused on our economy going forward. 2021 is the year we start doubling down on our economy. In the next six to 12 months, Anyone who pays attention to the UAE is going to be a, is going to see a series of reforms, changes, adjustments to the regulatory environment, to the legal environment, to the economic environment. Rules and laws are going to be changed. Things are going to be really, really, uh, I would say, adjusted or streamlined so that we can double down on the economy. We have very ambitious targets. Uh, we're willing to go the extra mile, but we really want to be seen as an economic hub for the region and to do what we can to help use that economic might to stabilize things, places like Horn of Africa or the Indian or the Asian subcontinent. So I'm incredibly focused here in Washington on how we can use our relationship with the United States and other friends to strengthen our economy, increase our GDP in the UAE. And you, you know what I think is great about this conversation so far is, you know, we are talking about positive visions for the future, right? And I think when you know, when Americans look at the Middle East these days, they see, of course, all the negative news, the human suffering. I mean, you know, the, the, the great tra tragedy in, in Yemen and in, in Syria, the continued instability in, in Iraq, the collapse of the uh, of the economy, you know, in, in, in Lebanon, uh, for, for example, it just seems to be a string of bad news. Right. And, you know, you've been you've been ambassador to the United States since 2008. Right. So you, you've served through the entirety of the Obama and Trump administrations, now as the third administration, um, what would your advice be to, uh, to the administration in terms of how they should view American interests in the region? And what would you say to the American people on, on why the Middle East matters to them and, and to their future? So, you know, I'm admittedly a huge cheerleader for, you know, the U.S.-UAE relationship. That's why I've been here. That's why I've been here for 13 years. I am always looking for ways to strengthen the U.S.-UAE partnership constantly. But the debate I see happening in Washington, like I was saying, it's, it's very short-sighted. And the debate is always about, well, we, you know, the region doesn't export as much oil to the U.S. anymore. Therefore, it's not important. And to, to the, those who advocate that argument, look at just what happened in the Suez Canal a week ago. To those who don't think the Middle East is important, one canal being blocked for four days just almost shut down the global economy. Look at what happened when Saudi oil infrastructure was attacked a year ago. Oil prices around the world, despite the fact that the U.S. receives less Arab oil than it used to. So, you know, as, as, as Tom Freeman says, what happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. And I can give you 100 more arguments about why the region is important. But it's, for the, it's really important for me and for the reasons that you just said. The region does have potential for being sort of a catalyst for positive change. And while I can't speak for other countries, but just in the last two to three years, we welcomed the Pope to the Arabian Peninsula for the first time. 
we're about to build, we're in the progress process of building an Abrahamic house. An Arab country is putting its own money in building a synagogue for Jews to practice in Abu Dhabi. We hosted the world, the Special Olympics World Games. We're about to host Expo. We normalize with Israel. We put an astronaut into space and then we sent a probe to Mars. That's all within the next last three years. We're now focusing on, we, we're going to turn 50 years old this December. We're already planning for the next 50. And we're trying to be a catalyst for positive change. And, and what irritates me is exactly what you said is, you know, the region is often sort of brushed together with one big stroke or one big brush. And people aren't able to distinguish between the forces for good and the forces not for good. And I, I will keep advocating that there are some countries in the region who are doing their best to shed that perception and trying to tell people that no, there are positive, there is positive steps being taken and good momentum happening in the region. You just have to pay attention. You know, Yusuf, I, I think it's fair to say that if you look back across the last three administrations, that that the George W. Bush administration underappreciated or undervalued the risks and costs of action in Iraq in 2003. I think we could all agree on that. I think you know, President Bush would agree on that. But then I think we should also recognize that. I think it was under the Obama administration where we, we underestimated the risks and costs of inaction and disengagement from the region. Yeah. And you know, it seems like America is always saying, hey, we're done, we're leaving the Middle East. But we actually never really, really leave. But in saying that, we give up a lot of our influence, right? And you know, there are others who are waiting to, to fill that gap, fill that void of influence. And I'm, I'm thinking in connection with, uh, I'm thinking of, of Russia and, and, and China these days, right? Uh, an argument besides the one you mentioned, which is, hey, we don't buy that much oil anymore from the Middle East, so you know it doesn't really matter that much, is that, hey, well, now it's time for great power competition, right, with Russia and China, and therefore we have to get out of the Middle East, almost forgetting that the Middle East is itself an arena of competition, right? And, and I wonder if you might comment about the degree to which you see Russia and China viewing the region opportunistically, and, and uh, the degree to which they have maybe more freedom of action than they, they deserve to be because of this constant um, declaration that we're, we're out of there. So what I've seen, I'm sure you'd agree with me, is when anyone backs out or withdraws from an area, someone else is going to fill it. And that doesn't apply just to the Middle East. That applies anywhere. So if the U.S. has a footprint and a presence and influence somewhere, you decide to leave, it doesn't just become empty. Someone else is going to fill it. And, and the ironic part of that debate is, you know, it's all your friends are the ones who want you to stay. It's, it's your partners. It's your, your people you fight with, you invest with, you trade with. They want American engagement. They want American presence. They want American leadership. But when America says, yeah, you know, we're tired of this, we're leaving, fine. But then don't get upset when someone else steps in and takes your place. Well, you know, this is, I mean, <laughs> it does create space. I mean, I, you know, we had this discussion years ago when when uh, you were considering uh, normalizing relations with Syria again with the Assad regime, which I thought was a bad idea. I mean, you did it for, and, and I, I know you you'll use your influence there for good. Uh, but but I do think whenever we declare we're going to leave or we're not going to we're, we're not going to support our friends, it does lead to some hedging behavior. And and I think this is one of the reasons why kind of Russia gets a free ride right in the region because Russia is 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 really enabling Iran. Uh, in Syria, certainly, uh, and across the region, uh, but at the same time, they're posing as as the as as the firemen, even though they're one of the principal arsonists, you know, in the in the Syrian civil war, and and saying to to you and to UAE and and Saudi Arabia, Israel, others, hey, you know, work with us, keep Assad in power, which of course you know will perpetuate that Syrian civil war, uh, and then we'll work over time, you know, to diminish Iranian influence. Well, you know, I think we all know that's kind of a lie. <laughs> it is a lie. But what, what do you see Russia's designs in the region? And, and do you think there's any possibility of the countries in the region maybe imposing some more costs on Russia to get them to stop enabling Iran and stop enabling the, this murderous regime in, in, in uh, Syria? I think the desire is definitely there. And I can speak for, you know, just the UAE. We've had these conversations with the Russians about how we view Iran, how we want to, you know, work with Russia, and how we see our region and our future. Uh, that's not that's not a conversation that we've avoided having. 
but also it, it's you have a vote in this argument you have a vote in this debate you know a lot of people will behave differently if they know that they have american commitment involved it's like you said when america says well we're not sure what we want to do yeah you'll start seeing hedging and i think if you were in these countries you would probably do the same thing i think it's really important to continue to demonstrate american engagement american leadership because that's what your friends look for you know i I've, i've said this before one of the most important traits a superpower needs to have is consistency and reliability no. and if you don't have that we start looking around and saying hey what's going on what happens when the us is not there so it 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 really does come down to what we expect the us is going to do first and of course you know you have china this who's been very active in in the region uh, as well and 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 has been very active uh with the in the emirates also what do you see as the upside for china's increasing interest in the middle east and what do you see as the risks and um uh, and, and what you, what do you think uh what do you think china's really trying to achieve so i'm looking at this strictly from a uae lens and the, what i see with china is we see an economic and trade and investment partner like look our overall uh overarching vision economically as you know is diversifying away from oil and gas and becoming an economic hub and increasing our gdp you can't ignore the world's second strongest economy we can't not trade or do business with a country we sell a significant amount of oil to and is our largest trading partner and the good news is i think the us understands this um so we look at china as as a an important partner and player to help us grow our economy. I think the risk or the challenge comes into what I see more of a confrontational US China sort of cold war posture. Uh it's either us or them. I think that's not a good place for us to be. That's not a good place for most countries to be want to be. Uh we want to be Singapore. We want to have a good relationship with China mostly for economic reasons and we have a good relationship with the US for strategic reasons. and i think countries are going to get uncomfortable being put in a position where they have to choose so i hope it doesn't come down to that yeah i mean you so if i would say I, you know I, i would just qualify that by saying that uh the example of australia is one that i think is worth paying attention to right cuz i don't think it's really a choice between washington and beijing i think it's a choice increasingly between sovereignty and servitude for those who become over reliant on china right and and um you know you have the bludgeoning of indian soldiers to death on the himalayan frontier the the greatest land grab in history if they succeed in the south china sea the threats to taiwan the economic coercion to australia the wolf warrior diplomacy you know internationally so i you know i i i'm starting to i think the world is starting to come to the recognition anyway hey this isn't a washington beijing problem this is a you know a world you know chinese communist party problem do you think that there's any possibility of convincing chinese communist party leaders right that they can have enough of their dream without victimizing their own people internally whether it's the the genocide in in Xinjiang or the repression in Hong Kong they and they can have enough they can have enough internationally as well uh without pursuing their interests at other countries expense i mean that would be the best outcome for everybody right is if if the party's leaders would you know would come off of this campaign of of aggression that i think has been catalyzed almost by the covid-19 crisis I I always believe I'm an optimist by nature so I always believe that these things can be addressed or at least get to a position where we can find some common ground. I really do. I don't think we have the right environment for it today, but I think ultimately we can get there. You you know, you know I, I, what I'd like to do is just ask you kind of a, ge- a general question at at the end here and and to get your advice for at the by the Biden administration. Uh, as the Biden administration engages engages the Middle East now this is your, your, your this is the the third administration <laughs> where you're serving it in in Washington what do you think should be the top security priorities it, from a UAE perspective but a regional perspective and the, and the top economic priorities overall uh i think on the security question it's really easy it's it's you know iran iran's behavior not just the nuclear file but also extremism You know, we cannot continue to just ignore, you know, extremist voices and hate speech. It's exactly why we're building Abrahamic houses and promoting interfaith. We have to be much more aware of what goes on 
behind the scenes, funding to these groups. And I think we need to do a much better job of kind of calling, calling that out. Uh, on the economic side, you, you have to compete. You just have to come in and compete. You know, this is no longer a world where, you know, just Western companies come in and bid for oil concessions or technology. There, you have competition from China, from Europe, from India. The U.S. has to come in and compete. Um, it's hard for you to say, you can't use this technology because this technology is dangerous, but not provide the alternative. Okay, fine. I believe you. This company is risky. Where's the American counterpart? Where's the American competitor? And you know, also, you, you, not to interrupt you, I just want to say that this, is the, this was the case with the unmanned aerial system sale to the UAE, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't sell the U.S. Uh, drones, and now you bought Chinese drones, right? For, I mean, you know, I think $10 billion or something. So, I, I mean, I, it's, it, these are missed opportunities. I'm sorry, but go, go ahead. No, you're, you're, telling us, you're telling us that you won't commit to a relationship, but you don't want to see other people. It doesn't work. Yeah, we want to work with you. We want to work with you all the time. I've been working with American companies and technology and government for 20 years. But you can't say no to us and then say, oh, no, we can't, you can't go to them either. So you know, just recognize that it's a much more competitive landscape and you need to come in and compete. We want you to compete. We want to work with you. So just you know, pay attention to us. We want to do more business with you. Well, I, I just want to tell you from my personal experience in, in Afghanistan and in the region for many years, uh, the Emiratis have been just the greatest partners uh, from my perspective uh, and always with, you know, ready with wise advice, uh, but also ready to act as you did in, a, in, a, in Afghanistan by committing your forces there in really the, the fight uh, against these modern day barbarians on a frontier, you know, a modern day frontier between barbarism and civilization. And and you've been, I think, a force, as you mentioned, you know, for, for good uh, across across the region. So, so I, I just wanted to ask you just any any final words for for our viewers uh, before we thank you and and uh, and we end the program. I I think it's important that people understand that the fact that we fought with you in six wars in six coalitions, right, from Desert Storm all the way up to ISIS. That this is something we are proud of. It's not something we hide from. It's not something we're ashamed of. We say this in every opportunity we get, in every article, in every speech. We fought with the U.S. six times in the last 30 years. We are your largest trade partner for the last 12 years. You're our biggest market. We're your biggest market. These are things we take a lot of pride in. You know, it's your friends are proud to be your friends. Don't underestimate that and don't take that for granted. Well, I, I can't thank you enough. Ambassador Yusuf al Ataiba, uh, on behalf of the Hoover Institution, Shukran, thank you for helping us learn uh, more about battlegrounds important to building a future of peace and, and prosperity for generations to come. It's great to see you. Thank you, HR. Great to be with you. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.